Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. For today's episode, you have me, Peyton Hunter-Jones. You might recognize me as Georgie K. Zukov on Ask Historians. And me, uh, Johannes Breit, who you also might recognize as Kami Space Invader on the subreddit of Ask Historians. We'll be having a conversation about the subreddit's favorite topic, by which, of course, we mean Adolf Hitler. Or more specifically, the best part about Hitler, which is to say, his death. You all know the basics. With the Soviets closing in on the Berlin bunker, he blows his brains out. You probably also know that there is an unending parade of conspiracy theories about how that is not the way it ended. Spoiler alert at the front, guys. He really is dead. And not because he would be over 130 years old today. But the history is quite a mess, so it's understandable how stories might grab people. So today, we're going to jump on in and dissect all of that. Let's start with the simplest of sketches about how this topic even came to be. The Soviets are closing in on the bunker. Hitler kills himself, and his remains are burned, along with his wife's. But for those in the West, there is no confirmation. It is only stories filtering through about what supposedly happened, and there's no body, and the Soviets are not saying a thing. Rumors of Hitler's survival would persist on the fringes for decades. And today, thanks to sensationalist television such as Hunting Hitler and poorly argued books such as Grey Wolf, you are probably familiar with the theory that Hitler escaped to Argentina. These conspiracy theories purport to be telling the real hidden history of what happened at the end of the war against Germany. To be sure, there is some fascinating and hidden history about just what happened to Hitler's remains after the war, but it is quite divorced from the absolutely crazy claims that works such as these peddle. They ignore some of the hard evidence and misconstrue other pieces as well, something which we'll explore later. But what we'll start off with here is the most amusing aspect of this all, and how these works claim that they are telling a history not only hidden, but one which was actively covered up by the Western governments. One of the central sources for all these works are government documents, which they claim show Hitler survived, and which the government, of course, then covered up. But the irony of all of this is that none of these researchers are plumbing the depths of some forgotten archive to find a top-secret document which the government forgot to hide. You, too, can read these documents at vault.fbi.gov slash Adolf Hitler or the CIA's online reading room, which lacks a fancy Hitler page but includes similar documents for you to peruse. Put plainly, these documents include many accounts of Hitler sightings, but they document none which panned out. This is what we might call the crank file. It doesn't only include sightings in South America, but people claim they saw him in, for instance, a Quebec hotel or enjoying the cafe life in Amsterdam. To focus only on sightings that fit one's theory divorces the file from its context in the best of circumstances. And more generally, these documents fit in better with crackpot theories about secret Nazi bases in Antarctica or on the moon than they do with serious evidence about Hitler's survival. I mean, it's it's something the Simpsons did a joke about. It's it's something that one of the earliest Simpsons jokes uh, is, is is about. It's like from one of the earliest seasons where you have like Hitler in Argentina and somebody says Buenos noches, mein Fiora. And and so it's it's a very it's a very pervasive cultural phenomenon that is founded on not much as we will see. Yeah. But it captures the imagination, though. And, I mean, I think, like, we see this on the subreddit. We, I see this on other uh, subs on Reddit. I see this on sites outside of Reddit. I mean, it captures the imagination. And, of course, there's, like, there's that one fact that everyone knows about Hitler and his death, which is that there was a piece of his skull in Russia, and a guy went and tested it, and it turned out that it was a woman probably in her 40s or so and they think that settles the matter and going back to these shows going back to these books they love to hammer on that fact this is probably the single most important fact for the rise of hitler death conspiracies in the past 11 years i think that aired in 2009 and it's it's i mean if you present it just in that narrow frame it's a good one i remember the first time i read about that i this was something i hadn't looked into i was like holy shit what the hell's going on here like I at least had a moment of why was this even why did they think this was Hitler's skull in the first place and what does this mean? To be sure, I did not think that it meant that he had escaped Argentina, but uh, <laughs> I def it def it was it was newsworthy, you know. Right, right, and I think that we have seen like there is a veritable like Hitler cottage industry in the sense that that there is reliably reliable Hitler content being churned out by by various outlets, and I feel like. 
the the supposed skull discovery as well as 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 several other things connected with the with the alleged flight to wherever and 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 the alleged survival of Adolf Hitler really was a blessing for this whole industry that has um produced tons and tons and tons of content in the wake of like um crack it articles and 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 like the historic the historification of 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 clickbait in 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 the virtual sense no absolutely like hitler conspiracy theories are definitely purpose made for the era of clickbait and i like it sounded for a moment i thought that you said crackhead.com you meant cracked but that's actually that's freaking perfect. <laughs> yeah i mean i mean like i feel like i feel like this is the second like the whole like history repeats itself as a farce thing is might not be such a farce because I feel it reminds me of the the like yellow press of the sixties and seventies where it's like Elvis sighted somewhere in I don't know South America together with the Area Fifty One aliens and it's it's basically it's the new millennia version of that is hey look we made this we made yet another Hitler documentary because Hitler. Hitler sells. It's 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 it's. Uh, I'm just waiting for another repeat of the entire like Hitler Diaries affair, just because oh it it it, it's it, only it time. yeah because it it offers itself up so much and we see it on the sub like people love to talk about the person of Adolf Hitler, which is in my historic like in my historian's opinion the most uninteresting part of the whole affair. But that's that's another matter for another time probably. And I mean, I think it also it also just fits into that like general pattern of second opinion bias that you see when people like you learn about something and you learn it in school one way, and then you're confronted with something that if you really dug down, it wouldn't make sense, but it just like overturns that, and you're like, wow, maybe I learned this wrong. Maybe they're lying to me, and it definitely appeals to something that I mean, I don't want to say it is something that only appeals to a fringe group. I think that it appeals to a lot of people. And critical thinking will generally point you away from that eventually, but there is just this appeal. Like you want to believe that there's some deep secret history that you're learning and was kept away from you and that you're now part of this secret group who knows the truth. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that plays a huge part with it and 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 the whole like the way also this sort of history is taught also enables that movement because there is very little focus on on on, on structural um factors in in the way we talk about that that period of time and that 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 the crime that was committed it's it's very it's very much focused on the person of Hitler as the sole origin of, of the Holocaust and so on and so forth. And that's another reason why I think Hitler sells so well and, and does so well in terms of, uh, in terms of public attention. And I mean, like in, 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 in our quest to investigate this whole matter we we came across like just, be, just in the matter of Hitler's death, you meet, all kinds of people from like committed um, forensic scientists like uh, Dr. Nick Bellatoni, who, who, who we will get to, who I think you had email correspondence with while yes. we were. He, um, he, was, he was a wonderfully helpful guy for all this. Right, right. And then on the other hand, you have you have like French scientists who write in purple prose yes. and weird Germans who are just outright weird and who we will also talk about uh, in the course of this episode today, I think. Yeah. So um, let's let's jump in. So right now we've just talked about what most people know, which is in 1945, Hitler shot himself in 2009, that skull fragment that was claimed to be his, was overturned. And I think pretty much between that point and then, people don't have any sense of what happened and why we got to this point. So let's back up and let's go to the day after. Yes, let's uh, let's do that. Like 1945 Berlin, especially 1945 Berlin in, 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 in April and May of 1945, were a rather chaotic place. 
I think you're underselling it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that, that, you know, that order had been breaking down, that nobody was really in charge anymore, that there were these bubbles of, of, of like loyalists to the Nazi regimes who fought with the Russians. There were bubbles where the Russians had established control. There is a whole, like, it, it's, it's pure chaos in, in, in a certain sense. But in, within this chaos, uh, after Hitler shot himself on, 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 April, on April 30th, um, the news spreads rather fast, actually. Like hardly a day later, a man named named Seifert um, was sent to the former Gestapo headquarters in Berlin to negotiate with the Red Army about a ceasefire. And he reported that he was greeted by a bunch of Red Army soldiers who waved at him and who who shouted, "Hitler kaputt." So Hitler is dead, and 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 uh, when on the following morning the the Wehrmacht general Hans Gebs uh, sends like a missive to to the Red Army with the news of Hitler's suicide. All that he gets back is the message from Zhukov. We know. Um, so 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 news had spread incredibly fast that Hitler was dead, but um, it was still difficult to. To, to establish what exactly had happened. And while, while the Red Army was working on that and was generally keeping a lid on the whole thing, the West also started its own investigation. And this brings us to, to Yu Trevoropa. Yu Trevoropa was a, an, a British intelligence officer who later became a professor of history in one of the big British universities at can't remember if it was Oxford or Cambridge. He was an Oxbridge guy. In Oxbridge, just, yeah. yeah. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, and he was knighted and 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 got some kind of uh, some kind of uh, nobility title, which with the British it's all a very different thing. But anyway, he he was at the time an intelligence officer and a historian, a medieval historian. But he was sent out there because of his proclivity in fact gathering, and it was he was charged with finding out what had happened to Hitler. And I'm sure many of the people listening to us here have seen the downfall, at least, or had have at least seen the downfall memes, but they probably also have seen the movie at some point. And basically the whole the movie, The Downfall, it largely reproduces you Trevor Oper's investigation. Like he went out and he interviewed people who had been in the bunker, who had... Uh, witnessed the last couple of days of, of, of Hitler and Eva Braun and, and who basically shaped this entire narrative. Like they commit suicide, the driver carries them out, he douses them in gasoline, he burns them down. And um, he published, like, you Trevor Roper, this is the investigation he would conduct and he would publish later on to much accolades. And this is the book that for the West shapes what had happened basically until today yeah, i mean it was the standard tome for 50 years it's i think it's in the eighth edition now and every one they add more information they add more to the intro to this cover so a little more information's come out but nothing i think what's i think what's so fascinating about him is i could you could take the first edition give it to someone and there's minor things to correct but for the most part they would have a fairly accurate picture of what happened with pretty minor and you'd have very little you need to correct for them yeah, I mean, you Trevor Oper, he did, he did, like, he was rather meticulous in his approach. And you can see, like, where his expertise as a historian comes in, in the sense of how painstakingly he dissects the whole thing and, like, retraces virtually every step. Like, you can re recreate what happened basically hourly, which, again, is shown in, for example, the downfall. He's uh, he did he did a great job, and then I mean you also need to like that was with pretty much no help whatsoever from the Soviets, which is even more impressive. Seeing as so many witnesses who he would have liked to talk to were already within the Soviet sphere and were being made unavailable. Right. I mean, if you look at uh, Zukov, he gave a he hinted that they that Hitler was dead, and he hinted that they had even found remains, and then he gives this press conference a couple of days later where he's been instructed by Stalin to just say, hey, we know literally nothing. We don't have a body. We don't know if he's dead. Maybe he went to the West. We don't know. And from then on, the Soviets, they don't, they're not saying Jack. And Roper has to work with that. And yeah, like you said, he, 
he had the training of a historian and his results speak to what those skills can do for you. Yeah. And I mean, he also, I think, I, I'm, I think this is in some cases, he even goes so far as to like promise people immunity from any kind of persecution when they tell him what, what had happened. And that's how he coaxes the basic narrative out of them for, for the last days in the bunker. So now let's shift over a little bit and talk about the Soviets for a bit, I guess, because Hugh Trevor Roper, he's doing his work here. He's doing interviews and basically trying to piece together everything from what other people have told him, what other people saw. And he makes this, and he has a pretty good idea of what happened. But the Soviets, they control the bunker. They control Berlin. They they have Hitler. They find, within a couple of days, they find dental remains roughly where they expect to find them based on information that they've gotten from survivors of the bunker. They find some dental work that they recover and they arrest two uh, assistants to Dr. Hugo Blasch, uh, Fritz Ekman and Kath Hausermann. They bring them in. They have them independently sketch out the bridge work that they've done for Hitler in the past. And then they compare that and they have a match. Two independent people provide information that matches what the Soviets have. In a court of law, as far as forensics is concerned, that would, that would be sufficient to prove that this is who it is. And if we have any doubts, a couple decades later, uh, Dr. Ryder Sognas and Ferdinand Strom, they use x-rays that were taken in 1944 and were captured by the U.S. Army. They find these 1944 x-rays of Hitler, and they compare it to those same remains, and they get the same results, again, proving that these are his dental remains. But the Soviets, they even though they have this, like we said, they clam up. As far as we know, and not to not to defend my favorite guy here, but as far as we know, Zukov, he didn't even know that this identification had been happened. He just had instructions to be like, we don't know anything. And as far as he knew, we didn't, they didn't know anything. The Soviets played it incredibly close to the chest and only allowed a few people to really know the truth. But that being said, information still was filtering out and the West kind they didn't know what had happened. But some people were getting hints. Some people were hearing what was going on here. Um, Hausermann, she was arrested a couple of days after and brought to do the identification, but they let her go. And she told a friend of hers that she had identified Hitler's teeth. And then she gets arrested again. So does Ekman. So does pretty much everyone who was within earshot of the bunker. And they're all taken to Moscow where they're imprisoned for the next 10 years or so. But Hausermann's friend... He eventually tells the West, and I believe that the first reporting that Hitler's teeth had been identified actually shows up in a British newspaper only a month after the death of Hitler. It's just like this little blurb being, but it's secondhand information, so they can't run with it too much, but it's a little blurb just being that so-and-so heard from so-and-so that she had identified his teeth on behalf of the Soviets. The Soviets did not confirm this information, and it's that confirmation that's lacking. Exactly. And I mean, it even, I think it gets like you, Trevor Roper, stumble upon this. He had that information. I don't think he puts it in the book, though, because he didn't want to rely on hearsay. He he was like, you know what? That's probably believable. But hey, he's a good historian. He's not going to report friend of a friend stories, you know? It was true, but he's good not to report it. Right, exactly. It it, it gets included later in, in one of the later editions. I think it shows up as early as the third edition, but I, I'd need to check that. I can say it's at least in the seventh because I have the first and I have the seventh. <laughs> I have not read the second, third, fourth, or fifth, or sixth. There's only, there's only so far I'm going to go in this research. And, true, true. But I think that it's important to stress here that with 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 like what Echtmann and Heusermann provide, like they are the assistants to Hitler's dentist. They are show like they sketch out the teeth of Hitler. They 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 provide every detail they know, and and it matches evidence the Soviet has. And this 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 gets again discussed in the West in more detail in subsequent years. Like in 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 nineteen forty eight, uh, the 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 Germans before there is even a federal republic, the Germans have a a a like legal proceeding on the denazification of Hitler where in the most unsurprising move ever they declared that you know Hitler was a Nazi after all 
Surprise, surprise. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and they do that, like uh, Bavaria does that because they need to seize his assets, which they, they, they own um, virtually until this day. I think I think the the, the, the the house he lived in in Munich is not police station. And uh, the state of Munich still owns the like rights to um, Mein Kampf, which was... No, they, they lost those last year, actually, if I remember right. The copyright ran out. It, it ran out, right. That's what the main... What, yeah, that's why like, they did why that they big, the, new, with, yeah. Yeah, the big new annotated edition came out because they were like, hey, if it's going to be published, we want to make sure it's published right. Exactly. Which th- th- That has its own problems. <laughs> I feel like I've read that one and it's, it's, it's difficult. But yeah, they came out with that because it ran out. Out, but but for the longest time they had the lid on on Mein Kampf and on, on it being republished, and the other like legal proceeding like that gets involved here is in 1952 a legal conflict over a painting that Hitler bought from someone arose because the someone he bought it from claimed probably rightly that he was under duress when Hitler approached him about buying uh, buying his Vermeer. It's a safe bet. It's a pretty safe bet. And so they need to know if he's dead or not, like legally at least. And so the district court in Baptist Garden uh, duly begins investigations. And here's uh, in total 42 witnesses and commissions a uh, forensic and toxicological report and even sends people to East Berlin to survey the site where it happened in order to... um, construct another uh, reconstruction of what went down in 1945. And for this trial, they bring in uh, Echtmann and Häusermann, who by this time had been released by the Soviets. Yeah, they. I think Echtmann was in 53 and Häusermann in 54, or it might be 54 and 55. But they, 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 were, they were held in Moscow for almost a decade, though. Right, right, right. But they they come back in time because the 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 the, the Perfect district timing. court <laughs> proceedings. Yeah, yeah. They take until nineteen fifty six, when when the the local court in Bathurst Garden declares, declares that Adolf Hitler is dead, and they find him legally dead, and are now able to finally wrap up the whole thing with his belongings and with with potential heirs and so on and so forth. And this is this is like the first time that the West has real physical confirmation of what happened. They now have the direct testimony of Ekman. They have the direct testimony of Hausermann, who are now able to say, yes, we identified these teeth. We sketched them out. The Soviets then showed them to us. We confirmed that they were what we were sketching. And we saw the remains of Hitler. And this was, I mean, this was, I'm not going to say it was a bombshell because, again, people were pretty confident that's what had happened but it was still big news and you finally can you finally see books that are published after that that are able to report this information as opposed to Hugh Trevor Roper's hey I've interviewed all these people who confirmed this happened now they can actually be like this is what happened and this is what people saw and if you look at um Cornelius Ryan's book on the final days of World War II he interviews both of them and he actually has them sketch a copy of Hitler's dental work, which you can find in the book. He has he has little souvenir copies, which they signed for him, of Hitler's bridge work showing where his teeth are. And by the way, he had terrible teeth. Like his mouth was like half fake at that point. I don't know what I don't know what that says about uh, Hitler, but it doesn't say anything good. <laughs> Mental health is important. Nazis don't brush their teeth. That's that's the lesson here. Don't be a Nazi. Brush your teeth. Uh, I think I think if you're gonna take away anything from reading, from hearing us talk, and from reading our sub, this this is probably it. Yes. <laughs> this this is probably. This, 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 I've spent all this research just to bring you important dental hygiene notes. Right. But, <laughs> so, but anyway, so by ni- by the mid 1950s, things feel pretty settled. Like Hitler's dead. We have all these witnesses who can tell us what happened. And yes, there's minor disagreements, but it's eyewitness accounts. I mean, anyone who has read anything about how eyewitnesses happen, you expect these little discrepancies. People don't remember things perfectly. And now we have the physical evidence that comports with the general story we're going for. And everyone agrees this is what happened. But then 1968 comes around and the publication 
by Lev Bezmensky of the death of Adolf Hitler is something of a bombshell. We have suddenly not just these reports from people of what they did, what they saw. We have the written autopsy of what the Soviets claim was Hitler's body. And that's that's pretty big news. I mean, well, technically, like, we should backtrack. Technically, Bez- Bezmensky was not the first one to publish this. Yelena Rez- uh, Rezvskaya, she published in 1965 Berlin Notes. And I don't know why, but apparently no one noticed this was published or else they did and they just didn't pick up on the fact that it has a paragraph describing the discovery of his body. I mean, I looked this book up because I was the only one who was able to find it from the both of us, um, given that you have basically uh, like a whole world of libraries at your hands. And I, I mean, I do too, but I found this in like the local... No, I mean, I found this in one of the like local district libraries, which had it because it, it came from an old uh, East German um, contingent of, of, of books because it's, 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 it's basically it's the memoirs of, of a woman who had been a translator for Russian forces in Berlin. And it was translated to German because um, of the general interest for GD, for East German reading but it never received a very wide release. And it was written by a woman who had been a translator. So I think that might be a contributing factor to why it never made a big splash somewhere. Because, I mean, if you look, I mean, you honestly have to wonder whether, like, it was such a minor inclusion, the Soviet censors just didn't even pick up on it. Because if you look at Bezmensky, his, like, he literally was not allowed to publish in the Soviet Union. The, his book was only published in the West. Yeah. And clearly he had permission. He wasn't like, he wasn't a dissident. He was given clear permission and the Soviets wanted this published. That's the only explanation here. But he's given all this, inf- all these documents from the Soviet archives that no one had seen before. And he's the one who's given permission to tell the West what actually happened. Or at least he's just given permission to tell the West what the Soviets say actually happened. <laughs> and, uh, like you said, they, they have an autopsy. The Soviets suddenly claim, hey, we didn't just find dental remains. We found a body. Yes, yes. And and what a body they did find. Um, <laughs> the general story, I think, is that, that again, within the, cha- the chaotic stuff that's happening in, in, in Berlin in May 1945, um they know that hitler is dead and so what they do is they immediately send like a unit of of investigators of 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 basically intelligence officers to the side of the last chancellery to 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 look what's up and and the man who is generally credited with uh, among others finding hitler's body is uh, lieutenant colonel ivan klimenko who uh, is part of the 79th Rifle Corps, who um, hoisted the Soviet flag upon the Reichstag. And on the same day, basically, or eh, not on the same day, but ar- around the same time, he also searches the, the, the area around the Reichstag Chancellery where they you know, go through the debris they find there and look into like bomb craters. And um, what they find over several days is uh, most famously the corpses of Josef and Magda Goebbels, uh, the body of a German shepherd, badly burned also and shot, and the aforementioned pieces of jaw and brick bridge work. But not only that, they also find something else. They find like a one of Klimenko's men, a private named Jurakov, um, is in a bomb crater and suddenly calls out, Comrade, Comrade Lieutenant Colonel, there are legs over here. And what they find are the burned remains of a man and a woman who they wrap in, in, in cloth and rebury because... And and they only come come back and 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 unearth them the next day and bring them bring them to their um, forensic specialist, a, a man named Sharovsky, who then conducts an autopsy on these uh, two bodies, who they say is Hitler and uh, uh, Eva Braun, and they they basically it's 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 all very like it's. This is the body the the jaw fragment comes yes. from. Well, 
this is the body that they say the Jack Five. Okay. Well, we'll get to that in a bit. But we get to that in a bit. But yeah. they they <laughs> first believe they have another body. It's yes. not it's not the they only sh- body they find. Yes. They so <laughs> the, the good old darned socks guy, which <laughs> like as you say, they, they rebury the body. And I mean, if you read that in a vacuum, it's like, why the heck would they do that? They're looking for Hitler. They find a corpse that they can't identify. Surely they want to check this out. And it's because they found a corpse of a body that as the title of the body suggests, he was wearing darned socks and the corpse was roughly the right figure for Hitler and apparently had a mustache. And at least some people were like, Hey, we found Hitler. So they're, they think that they have him, but it quickly turns out that it's not actually him. And there is a lot of discussion about what this body actually was, which it's a interesting little digression to the whole story because you because re- we like there is no answer. Some people suggest that this was a body double of Hitler's, but there's no real evidence that it was. I don't think there's even strong evidence that he consistently used body doubles to the point where he would be keeping some around. Um, And then another theory is that he was the cook in the chancellery, I believe. And he just happened to have a passing resemblance to Hitler. And the discovery of his body was just sheer coincidence and of course you also get some historians uh fest i believe suggests this as does joachim Thaler, who think that the soviets found a body that looked somewhat like hitler they purposefully doctored it up to look more like hitler and they just wanted to be like they just wanted a quick trophy they wanted something that they could show within a day or two and be like hey we found hitler's body look at this ha 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 we got him they wanted their mission accomplished sign and um Within a day, it pretty obviously was not Hitler. Anyone who looked at him and any Germans, they had a decent sense of what the guy looked like. They saw his ugly mug plastered on posters everywhere. They were like, no, that's not Hitler. What that you what the hell are you talking about? You found you found this other dude. So within a day, they're like, eh, maybe we need to actually find the real body. Because they they I mean they'd heard the same stories. They were pretty sure he was dead. They knew he'd been cremated in the garden. They, but uh, they didn't want to put the work in to prove it. Right. Uh, respectively, they, they found, like, if you see photos today that support uh, that purport to show the dead Hitler, whether it's it's like there's some video on YouTube of, of like the body lying around surrounded by Soviet soldiers. And then there's a couple of photos that allegedly show him um, where the auto- autopsy is performed. This is this is the other body. Because the real body from which the jaw fragment that that they um, identify, at least where the Soviets say that that is the body where it comes from and where the forensic pathologist writes that this is the body it comes from, this body is not a body anymore. It's basically like they describe it as the remains of a male corpse disfigured by fire delivered in a wooden box. That's... I mean, it's a corpse that they needed to use dental identification to figure out who it was. Right. That's what it comes down to in the end. They write specifically that the corpse is severely charred and smells of burnt flesh. It's like, it's not in a good good, good general condition, to, to put it like that. But the, the, main, the, the important thing to get back to after our wonderful little discussion about darn socks, um, I love the name. Uh, that's that's honestly the best part of them but the important thing to get back to is like they find that first body they don't announce it and to their to their good luck you you could say they at least didn't announce they'd found that before they realized it was a fake or before they realized they couldn't pass it off as a fake but now they find the real body and instead and while rumors start to get out that they found something within a couple days as we've already said they don't they don't announce anything and this is this is the crux of the entire issue if they had found it, if they had brought the Allies in to assist in the identification, um, the the Americans they had been preparing for this same thing. They, while the Soviets they had access to the dental assistance, the Americans they actually had Hitler's dentist himself. They had arrested him. They had him write up a full report on Hitler's teeth. They had those 1944 X-rays that uh, the army had found in an archive. Um, They were just sitting there waiting to find a body. They were waiting to do the same thing the Soviets actually did. 
And if the Soviets had brought in the West, if they had said, hey, we have this, we would have likely just had the Americans come in, do the same identification, arrive at the same conclusion. But the Soviets clam up, and the big question is why? Why did they not let this out? Why did they let it fester? Why did they let it become a conspiracy? Right, and I think I think that we don't know a definitive answer to that until until this day, and we probably never will because we we have talked about this before. I think like there is this very real and strong element of Stalinist paranoia that's oh, in there. Can't can't underrate it. <laughs> and and then there is also I think that there's the the politics involved, the politics of like 1945 German occupation and, and, and the very strong, or what, at least what I see a lot is, is, is not just, you know, we're going to put one over on the allies and, and, and say that, oh yes, Hitler fled to the West and is now being sheltered by the West. But there's also this element to it that the Soviets are deadly afraid of a resurgence of of German Nazism. They they they. I mean, you see this in even how they set up East Germany to, to a certain degree. Like they bring in this group of of exiled Germans from Moscow and put them in charge, and they know that those guys are neither the most popular nor the most genuine leaders of their people in that situation and that's why they 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 don't do a lot of like they do a lot of stuff they don't do a lot of stuff that the western allies do like the soviets never are be or aren't that big into like i don't know persecuting war criminals in comparison like they leave that to the germans because they know it's best handled like that and so i think they or at least my hypothesis is that they're keeping a lot of this back in order to to sow uncertainty and 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 sort of like um, quell any kind of like pilgrimage sites to that Hitler etc. in 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 the butt. Yeah, I mean there def there definitely is a element of preventing. They don't they don't want a shrine to Nazism and Hitler's remains would be that. And I mean if we jump forward briefly, you we can look at how they dispose of the body. Um, not to not to uh, cut out things. We'll get back to the whole steps to get there but in the 1970s these remains that the soviets have they incinerate them and they take the ashes and they dump them in secret in a river just to make sure that if this information ever gets out no one there's no spot where anyone can go and be like here's hitler's body let's worship it you yes know? yes yes it and it's extremely difficult exactly where they did that too like they're per being purposefully obtuse about it I mean, at the same time, though, I think that we can't we can't discount that the Soviets definitely saw a dual purpose here. You know, that's a motive, but they certainly we can't say that they were unhappy with being able to pull one over on the allies either. And I mean, I think that if you look at the broader scope of the Cold War, it's a common theme that conspiracy theories, you can actually trace them back to the Soviet Union trying to purposely spread just uh, untruths. So they they wanted, like, it, they, I'm not going to say they just wanted to make a laugh out of it, but they definitely saw value in being able to say to the Allies, hey, Hitler might not be dead and we think you're sheltering him. Or Hitler might not be dead and put them on a wild goose chase trying to find him. Going back to the FBI, the FBI file, Nothing in that file suggests Hitler escaped, but these are all rumors that the FBI heard about, and some of them they considered at least credible enough to write up a report, maybe send someone to interview the person and just figure out, hey, what did you see? Where did you see it? When did you see it? Because they at least need, they needed to cover your ass of the whole matter for that inkling 1% that there was something going on. It wasn't going on, and all of those reports are like, yeah, this was nothing. It was useless. We wasted our time. But they definitely, they. I mean, if the Soviets had cooperated from the start, none of that would have needed to happen. Absolutely. But there is a certain, it's a certain consistency with how Stalinist politics are conducted in general, I think, where, where the principle of it's better to keep something secret and wait for a moment, an opportune moment to reveal it and use it against someone potentially we don't know yet who that someone is and how we might use it against them but we know that 
information is super valuable to be used against people. And that's why it's better to keep it secret, to keep it on the wraps and to wait for the right moment to unpack it and to spring it on the world. And obviously for at least the Stalinists, that moment never comes because the way they reveal the information is in the end, not very spectacular and not part of a larger, let's say, cultural attack on on the West. It's just it's just that one book that comes out only in the West and with a certain kind of plot set by the leadership at the time. And like Bezminsky hit hit when he releases it, he, I believe, uh, in the introduction, he says that the reason they didn't do this is. If someone claimed to be Hitler and wanted to restart Nazism, then they can catch them in a lie and prove it. And who knows? Maybe that was part of their thinking. But uh, it, it, there's so many different reasons go into it. So, I mean, we have this fear of neo-Nazism. We have this desire to screw over the allies and put them on the wrong path. We have all these different claims that come together. But I think that the one that you just hit on, that Stalinist paranoia, that is that really gets to an important part internally of what impacted all of this search because stalin he like calling stalin paranoid i think underrates stalin's level of distrust of those around him and i mean even if you look at the studies of the autopsy report you can see why there are you can see that there are these inconsistencies that are enough to stoke that paranoia of stalin and so we look at the body, and if you read some people who write on this, um, they're not sure that the body is real, which is something that we definitely need to now address. And Stalin's paranoia comes from the fact that maybe this isn't Hitler's body. Do we have the body? He doesn't care that they have the dental identification. He just want, he, he really wanted that trophy. He wanted to be able to look Hitler in the face metaphorically speak well maybe literally i don't know it's stalin <laughs> but he want he wanted to have that nail in the coffin and for him the teeth weren't enough it wasn't something that he could see and was just there he is there's hitler happy he's dead so you have this autopsy report that suggests that there was enough of a body to do an autopsy it famously has the uh inclusion of that little inkling fact that hitler had only one ball which <laughs> If you have an autopsy report and you're talking about, I mean, I would say that the testicles are um, soft tissue that would burn if you are conducting a uh, incineration. I'm not a doctor, but that's my understanding. So having that suggest that the body was not in the total burned condition that the discoverers report it to have been in. So the discovery of the body and the autopsy of the body aren't, as well as the people who observed its burning, are not totally in line. So if you look at the people who watched it burn, um, Karnow, he describes it as reduced to a pile of ashes. Uh, Mansfield, he calls it no longer identifiable. And dental remains, they're going to survive through this. Without a doubt, the dental remains are true. They were positively identified in 1945. They were identified again in 1973 using the Russian report compared against the x-rays. And as we'll get to later on, they were... were again confirmed in 2017. So we definitely have these dental remains, but the body is a big issue. Some people just don't believe that they found a body or they found this mess of charred bone and melted fat and they call it a body, but that's it. So you have some people like Joachim Slaller who they and their last days of Hitler is probably one of the most thorough investigations that have been written up in the past 20 years. They don't believe that the body is in the state that it's reported to be in. Then you have some guys, though, like Werner Meser, who they oddly accept it totally as is. And I mean, we, we definitely need to talk about Meser here because he is, I think, the weirdest of the people who have written on this would you agree uh, absolutely i think that that you know maser is vana masa is basically in terms of weirdness he's one step above people like irving and the deniers 
which makes him only weirder because he's like the fringe of legit. And he's not even like he's not even that legit in the end. Like Werner Masa was a German historian. He was born in 1922 and he died in 2007. He held several positions at um, various institutes, but uh, towards the end of his career, he famously was a professor for history in Halle an der Saale uh, shortly after German unification, because uh, when Germany unified, basically everyone from the West had a suddenly a professorship in East Germany open up. But Maser is sort of like this weird fringe guy on 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 like the legitimacy of 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 historiographical research on Hitler. Like he he was made the 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 guy taking care of 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 like remaining stuff from Hitler by some of his relatives because he got Hitler's, in with them. Hitler's nephews made him the executor of Hitler's estate. How yes. weird is that? Yes, yes, that is super weird. Then he he he's the He's the origin of two facts that became famous during the whole Hitler Diaries affair. He is the origin of the idea that Hitler had an illegitimate child in France and that Hitler wrote an opera called Wieland the Blacksmith. What? I've, okay, this one I've never heard. <laughs> right, so uh, short digression here. Um, in the late 70s, a guy from East Germany who emigrated to the West decided to make a little extra money, and he was very adept as an art forger. His name was Kuyao, and he managed to find a reporter for the German magazine Stern who was willing to buy alleged Hitler diaries from him, which he completely faked. And he used, among others, Maza's work as a basis for these fakes. So he wrote the opera Wieland the Blacksmith, which Werner Maza had said that Hitler had originally written. And Kuyao completely faked an opera just to fool the Stern reporter into paying him more money for the diaries. Wow. So we now do have an opera called Wieland the Blacksmith, who about which Werner Maser said it was by Hitler, but it's actually by the East German faker or forger. That makes the Hitler diaries thing so much weirder. Cause like Maser, he was like the first one to be like, no, these diaries are fucking bullshit. But then he accepts the opera is real. He what did, is I, I don't think he accepted the opera as real, but he, 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 he was one of the first one to call bullshit, but then also one of the first one to reverse his judgment and then to reverse again. Like he, he flip flops during the whole diaries affair coming out on top somehow at the end and so saying, well, he I, just wants to be right. Exactly. And he's, he's, he's like, he is a, 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 he predates Reddit in how he approaches Hitler in the sense that he mostly writes about like Hitler trivia and that he has a book that, it, like the whole book, his whole book on Nuremberg is basically history is written by the victors, the book. It's even called like Victor, Victor's Tribunal or something like that. Well, his Hitler book is Legend, Myth, Reality, which I think that's, that is just the perfect subtitle for uh, <laughs> exactly. a book exactly on Hitler by someone who's a little too obsessed in the wrong way here. But let's, let's tie this back though, because I... Because I mean, we've talked about all the ways he's weird aside from this, but what what makes it so weird is that like of all, so you have histor like pretty much every historian agrees that the teeth are legitimate. Some of them agree that the body is legitimate. Some disagree the body is legitimate, and then you have a lot who are in this in between, which we're going to get to. But Mazur is the only one I know of who thinks the body's not real. I mean, sorry, that he thinks that the body's real, but the teeth aren't real, which is so weird because so like and his evidence for this in his hitler book is based on interviews with people who claim he never interviewed them that's the best part <laughs> so his testimony on the discovery of the body and his basis for like what he believes for his accepting the body is based on an interview with otto Gunsha and joachim staller interviews Gunsha 20 years later and he says, I do not know this gentleman, meaning Maser, and I never said this to anyone. That's that's a that's his direct quote. So the citation for Maser on the body is fake. But it gets weirder when we then get to his reason to doubt the teeth, where he writes, um, Ekman explicitly told the author on 20 October 1971 that he had not been able to determine from the dentures showed him whether the teeth had belonged to Hitler. But 
as we already discussed, Fritz Ekman testified in court that that was literally what he was able to do. This is from his his direct testimony to court. He writes, after my interrogation was over and my statements had been checked by the expert, he also told me there had been no doubt that the three dental fragments originated from Hitler and Eva Braun. He he was absolutely ironclad in his identification and he never changed it. He was clear in the court. He was clear a decade later when he was talking to Cornelius Ryan and suddenly Masser, he's claiming that Ekman told him that he was not clear and he didn't believe they were real. I, it blows my mind to think how this guy was able to publish all of this and just get taken seriously. It's, it's so weird that like, Hitler, I think that there's a whole episode, uh, like there's a whole discussion to be had about Hitler's scholarship in the 70s, where, you know, David Irving started out as a legitimate guy. Um, and I think I think there's a lot more to be said. But I think that that right now we can take it back to like another weird thing, which is the skull, which was not part of the original body, and which gets only dug up later but i'm i'm think i'll head that over hand that over to you so let, well let's build up to the skull fragment because we talked about that at the beginning and how like that's that's the piece that everyone knows about and these teeth which are the important one people really don't know about i mean if you again going back to gray wolf i when uh, the 2017 report on the teeth came out i uh i tried i got in touch with the author of gray wolf and i was like hey how does this uh, impact you're writing because you know you like if you read the book they hammer on the skull at several points and they basically imply that that's the only forensic evidence that ever showed up they legitimately pretend the teeth never existed and they continue to they continue to maintain that so it's like the, the teeth being identified probably is not going to change anything as far as the weirdo conspiracy theorists go but it's one of the, it's it's inconvenient evidence that people would rather just didn't exist if this is what they want to believe because they cannot get rid of it. And that's why it's so important. But this skull fragment is also pretty important. So we got to build up to that. But I think we also need to close out one final thing on the body because we've talked about how there's this spectrum of belief on the body, you know? So you have Joachim Slaller who doesn't believe there's a body. There's a Macer who has these weird fucking beliefs that no one can make sense of. And... <laughs> I think a lot of scholarship has followed Joachim Slaughter at this point. Um, Kershaw, I know that's his main source when he discusses that in his uh, biography of Hitler. He basically accepts Joachim Slaughter's determination that anything that was discovered was pretty much unidentifiable, and the teeth were the only remnants that were usable, which gives us basically three broad approaches that we can use to view this autopsy report. The first approach, obviously, is... The autopsy report is legitimate. If this is true, that means that the witnesses who saw the body burn, they, I mean, it's understandable. They, the, soon after the body was lit up, the garden getting, was starting to get shelled. A lot of them had to run underground. The shelling turned up the ground and parts, like parts easily could have gotten buried and they thought that they were now gone. We can understand how that might happen, but it doesn't really comport well with too many of the witness statements, which is why, uh, Authors like Joachim Saller reject the total truth of the autopsy. The other extreme is outright rejecting that a body existed and that the autopsy was created, created from whole cloth. They keep it secret for a couple of decades, probably because it's not real. But um, this reading of it basically comes down to they needed more. Stalin wanted them to produce more and in all likelihood, Stalin probably didn't know then that the, autop the autopsy was fake. If they, they created, they, they found something, they create an autopsy report and they give it to Stalin because he's demanding more and more evidence. And they're like, hey, no, we found the teeth. And he's like, no, I need more. So they give an autopsy report to get him off their fucking backs because it's Stalin and you got to just give him what he wants. Right, because uh, because I think that what also plays a part in in how the autopsy report was formed, or at least that there's there's reports also about interagency fighting, which which no doubt will become very important in a minute. But but there is a sort of like Sharovsky is a that the guy who conducts the autopsy, he is a respected forensic anthropologist who or a doctor of forensics who also is instrumental in 
investigating the remains of Nazi crimes in the Soviet Union. So his, his work is generally accepted within scientific circles, but he's also of the army or of the army intelligence rather. And then this is where Smersh comes in, in a certain sense. But I mean, so that gets us to the final one, which I think, I mean, on the whole, I think that the middle ground is not, it's not only defensible, but it's also, you can make it fit with the determinations of Yalcom Sala. You can make it fit with the determinations of Kershaw. And it's basically that they found something. I mean, the report of finding the legs in the garden, they basically, I mean, they basically find some shin bones with some flesh attached to them. If you read what they state there, what they find in the garden is not human in any reasonable sense. It was certainly disfigured enough that they just decided to rebury it for a day. So if you take this middle ground, it basically comes down to the Soviets found something. It was in the right vicinity. And when they did an autopsy, the pressure to make sure that it fit what they needed probably meant that they expressed more confidence on those whole remains than was necessary. And they tried to then use the dental remains as a crutch to give it more verisimilitude, mm. which I think that if we have to accept one story, that probably is, I don't want to, again, you can't go back and you can't just see what happened, but I think that that fits with, What's most likely, it fits also, again, with what Joachim Saller thinks. He thinks that there wasn't a body. And if you approach it in that way, there basically wasn't, you know? The autopsy isn't necessarily correct because they didn't find anything that was autopsyable. But that doesn't mean that they didn't find something. They found, they found bones. They found some charred flesh. They found some congealed fat. And they found some dental that in cremation is able to withstand the kind of heat that the rest of the thing would uh, burn up with. Right. I mean, there is a whole argument to be made that it's actually harder to cremate a body with gasoline than, than, than as usually, especially in the open air. Exactly. Like, exactly. You're, you're not doing it in a kiln. You don't have the concentration of the heat. Exactly. And they, they say they just douse it with gasoline and, and put a match to it. And that's what, what, what burns. Like they don't even dig, uh, a, a grave because they plan on going and doing that later when they get shelled but i think it also fits very well with with you know with the whole situation in 1945 uh, berlin in may where there's a whole lot of uncertainty and they find something and and i i would say it's reasonable to say they found something and they bring it back and and the circumstance fits and so the forensic expert presents the autopsy report as more certain than it than he would under normal circumstances i think that's a fair yeah. assessment yeah i mean like i don't it's one of those things i don't like making pronouncements on anything outside of the dental remains that one i will stake anything on it if you make me <laughs> if it comes down to the body and you put a gun to my head i'm gonna be like you know what they 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 found something and it was gross. That's that's about the most I'm willing to tell you. Yeah, right. I mean, when they when they 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 they, they talk about it again when they dig it up in the seventies, and they basically I think they describe it somewhere as a jellied mass. Oh yeah, no, it, it sounds it it sounds absolutely disgusting. And plus, you have the bodies of the Goebbels, you have their children, you have Krebs, you have a dog. It's I'm I'm sure I'm sure that was probably the worst thing those poor guys had ever smelled in their life when they unburied that. But so we've talked about the body. Now we got to get to the skull fragment. And why does this skull fragment even exist? Which is it shouldn't. That's what it comes. <laughs> that's what the story comes down to. That skull fragment is so freaking stupid, and its existence and place in this story is literally absurd. Yet it somehow managed to become the centerpiece. And I think I mean it became the centerpiece because I think a skull fragment with a bullet hole in it is just more compelling than I found someone's dentures, you know? Right. It's 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 very much a product of, guys, we have to come up with something quick. Oh, look, what do we have here? Why does this exist, though? So the body and the dental remains. As Joe said, this investigation back in 1945, it was conducted by Smirsch. High Bond fans, Smirsch is real. It wasn't quite what the movies make it out to be, but Smirsch was real. Uh, death to spies. Um, this was the Red Army intelligence apparatus at the time. 
they they had a closed case. They had found the teeth, they identified the teeth, but they didn't do a good job on the details. They don't have a cause of death, which was actually really important. This mattered a lot to Stalin. He, because all these reports, some of them are saying that Hitler poisoned himself, but most of them are saying that he shot himself. The ones that some attempt to kind of make it both where he poisons himself and he has someone shoot him for him because he's too cowardly to shoot himself. But this actually matters a lot to Stalin. What he really wants is to prove he wants a clear cause of death and he wants that clear cause of death to be poison because he wants to make sure that Hitler died a coward. But Smirsch, they didn't do a very good job. This autopsy report, again, getting back to that, it's not a very good autopsy report and it doesn't necessarily fit exactly with what they found. So the case is now handed off to the NKVD. And Smirsch, they are pretty offended by this. And now you have this interagency rivalry where NKVD needs to do the same investigation that Smirsch already did. And Smirsch is not going to cooperate at all. And this operation is called Operation Myth. <clears throat> so the NKVD, they go back a year later. This is 1946, a full year after Hitler shot himself. The war's been over. Thousands of people have walked through, through this garden. Many other people have died in this garden. And they start digging, though. And this is what the report says. At a depth of 50 to 60 centimeters, two fragments of a skull were found. In one of those fragments, there was a bullet hole. The remnants of some cloth, the remnants of a shoe sole, a braided dog collar, and the bones of an unidentified small arm animal were also found as for two gasoline canister. Um, There's an outgoing bullet hole. The shot was fired either in the mouth or the right temple at point blank range. The carbonization is the result of the fire effect which badly damaged the corpse. Based on this, which it must be emphasized is entirely circumstantial evidence, they decide this is Hitler's skull because everyone's saying he shot himself. The body was cremated. It's roughly in the same place that body would have been, and there was burning on them. And voila, this must be Hitler. That's what they decide. But that there, it's, it's not a very good basis for it. I think we can agree. But even so, this is very, very embarrassing to Smirsch. And they were already not cooperating, and now they're really not cooperating. They refuse to turn over the body. They are not going to let the autopsy be redone. Um they want nothing to do with this. And the exit wound, though, it suggests that the suicide was by gunshot. And this now becomes the accepted story within the Soviet Union. And I would note that this was, again, not really the result that Stalin wanted. He wanted it poisoned, but without a doubt now it is death by gunshot. But this Operation Myth file, it is now sealed up and it is deep sixed. They do not let this thing get out. Um, when Bezminsky releases his files, he doesn't know about Operation Myth. He's only given the Smirsch files. So everything that comes out comes from that autopsy report, which insinuates poison. Um, there's reports of glass shards found, which would be from the poison capsule amulet, uh, ampule, um, which... You put the cyanide in it, you bite your teeth down, and you die. Um, but uh, <clears throat> So that's in that autopsy report. But they don't have anything about the gunshot because even that autopsy report, again, it's not complete, and it doesn't have all the skulls. So this fragment fits in because the autopsy didn't have a skull fragment. So, hey, this skull fragment must be it. But that is really the only basis. And... It's totally unknown even after the revelations of 1968. Then in the 1990s, this is this is. I mean, I mean, you can, you know how much changed in the 90s. The Soviet archives suddenly open up, and researchers can see all the stuff that happened. Right? I mean, think about all think about all your research that's changed from this. Right, right, absolutely. It's it's like it cannot be overemphasized what a pivotal moment in terms of research on. Nazism and and the Holocaust and the war this was because it's it's just so much. It was Christmas for historians. Yes, 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 and it was a ver it was a veritable free for all for some time. I mean, yeah, like those first couple of years, my like it was well before my time, but my impressions just like Western historians 
fighting with each other to try and get in first and get access to all these things. And eventually the Russians, they close the archives back up. They stop letting people have free reign like they did. But there's a couple of years where all this information is coming out in a way that no one had access. And one of this is Operation Mythfile. A uh, reporter named Ada Petrova, she was at the archives and I believe she was researching something about Stalin and the curator, he just offhand mentions to her that, oh, hey, by the way, did you know that we have a fragment of Hitler's skull here? It's like buried in the archives and it's been kept basically secret, but suddenly it's the 90s. The Soviet Union's fallen and now he can just tell people about it. And he tells her first. Um, I believe that there's like a couple hints about it before then. But she's the first one who really gets the story. She gets the skull fragment and she gets the Operation Myth file. And she and Peter Watson, they start doing more research into this file. They have, and they publish it as The Death of Hitler. I believe that was published in 1994, 1995. And its big revelation is the skull. And the weird thing is that they have a guy, Professor Victor Ziagen. He identifies it as Hitler's skull, but he only does it based on morphological analysis. So he actually isn't saying it's Hitler's skull. He's just saying that it fits what I would expect Hitler's skull to be, <laughs> which is, I know, it's weird. And <laughs> the amount of certainty that he ascribes to this, and I mean, when, when the podcast goes up, I'll post some pictures of this skull fragment so you can see how much we're actually working with here. But it's not even fist-sized, I would say. It's just this little fragment with a bullet hole in it. And he's just going to say, yeah, sure, that is definitely it. I can't say for certain, but if you made me bet on it, it is uh, that Hitler skull. I guarantee you. Right. And, and I think it's important to mention that we can't compare it to the other remains that um, are there. Because you have the skull which they find. And I think it's Pedro and Watson who also find the, the Operation Archive um, files, where where it's for the first time confirmed what actually happened to the body, which the Soviets, what they find in the autopsy, they bring to Magdeburg, to the Red Army base there. And they, they, they bury it under the base and leave it there until you know, further notice. Like, they don't know what to do with it, but they, they have it on the concrete under a Red Army base in Germany. What's going to happen? And and in the 70s, they uh, negotiate with the East German authorities, and the East Germans say, well, we would like our base back. And somebody who notices that, who knows about what happened, writes a frantic letter to Moscow to the uh, then chief of the KGB and later general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Yuri Andropov. And he tells him, German Andropov, we have a problem. Like, under our army base, there are the remains of Hitler, and now the Germans are going to get them back. What are we going to do if the Germans find Hitler and erect a shrine to Hitler, and suddenly, like, the East German communists turn out to be Nazis all along? And, and so they initiate Operation Archive, where they dig up the skull, or they dig, not the skull, they dig up the remains, and, and also the remains of the Goebbels family and of General Caps, as well as several troves of important documents. And it should be, it should, we should note, it's called archive because the explanation is that they buried a bunch of archival material. Right. Right. And they say, well, we're just going to dig up these, these, these documents here, but what they really dig up are the dead remains of these people and they burn them and they scatter them into the Albi. And that's like, that's it for whatever there was in terms of autopsyable body. Like what's left now is the, the, the teeth and the skull and Petrova and Watson find the skull. So they find the skull and Zyagin, he looks at it and he's like, yeah, sure. And this, let's go over it. This is literally what he bases the assessment on. Um, the skull is adult the age that he estimates is between 45 and 55. So far, so good. He determines that there are widespread finger-made depressions indicating intracranial pressure as if this person is suffering from persistent headaches. That is that is one of the key parts of his determination. And judging by the color of the skull fragments, the person was a vegetarian. 
it normally said Zachary Ziag, and the skull color is yellow, but in the case of this skull, it is gray-blue. And Hitler, of course, was famously a vegetarian. So based on the headaches, which he determines from pressures, and the call of the skull, he is absolutely certain that this must be Hitler's skull. Well, I, should, I say certain, but uh, two, this, is, this is the quote from uh, Petrova and Watson. Ziagin said he was 80% sure that the skull was Hitler's. His doubts were there as a scientist who rarely claims to be certain of anything, which is to say they're really trying to imply that he was 100% but couldn't say it. And that's literally all he's basing this on, though, which is uh, it's not very good. I think we can say that for the least. Um, one thing, though, that uh, it does establish, and I think that this is a really popular idea of how Hitler died, um, it's the idea that he both bit down on a cyanide capsule and shot himself at the same time. And everyone, and when people tried to propose that theory before to try and make it so both happened, everyone's like, you literally can't do so because if you take a cyanide capsule, the moment you bite down, you're going to like lose motor function and it's so quick you can't shoot himself. And his, and the Ziagen, he's the one who, I, if I had to trace all these claims, I feel like it would probably come back to this citation in the mid 90s. But he claims that it's because the shot would have broken the cyanide capsule at the same time, which, sure, why not? Let's go with that guy. Um, I don't, if, if that honestly is like the most reasonable conclusion that he arrives at out of any of this. The main takeaway here is that this guy claims to be m- at minimum 80% sure. And I think any reasonable reader of his analysis should probably be like, that's 10% at best. But anyways, whether or not Ziagen was overestimating his own abilities, which I think was the case, Not everyone is buying into this. If we go back to our best buddy, Werner Maser, he is one guy who is like, no, that's bullshit. And he's not the only one, though. A lot of historians are like, "Eh, this seems like maybe it's his, but I think that if it is, that's literally just out of sheer weird luck. Russia, though, they don't actually care. They take this and they run with it. In 2000, there's a display put on by the archives, which is called The Agony of the Third Reich, The Retribution. Great title. And they put this on display. It's like they, it's, it's the trophy that they always wanted. And I don't believe that the teeth were put on display then yet, but they were eventually put on display as well. But the skull, again, like a skull with a bullet hole right in it, that just is... That's the one that is visually compelling. People look at that and you feel like, there, that's where Hitler shot himself. That hole right there. So that's the one that they want. That's their centerpiece of victory. That is the trophy that Stalin wanted. I mean, if you go back, there's stories about how Stalin wanted to put Hitler in a cage and parade him through Red Square for the victory parade. And whether or not that was true or not, he certainly wanted, he wanted that final emblem of victory and this was it for him you know right yeah absolutely yeah so russia they think that this is the best thing ever in 2009 though for inexplicable reasons they decide to put it to the test and i say inexplicable because again i feel like any rational person should have looked at the evidence here and just from the start been like i don't think that we can be as certain about this as we want to be But nevertheless, they allow researchers with the History Channel to come to the State Archive of the Russian Federation. The head scientist for this is Dr. Nick Bellantoni. He is working with the History Channel for a documentary that will eventually be released under the title Hitler's Escape, which tells you about the angle they're taking here. Fair (laughs) warning. Um, He goes to the archives. On camera, he's shown doing scientist things. Um, and I, I don't say this to denigrate him. He is a wonderful guy. I've corresponded with him about this. He's been incredibly helpful in the research for this episode. Um, I say this specifically to discuss how it is presented in the episode. I encourage people to watch it. And then we'll, all, then we'll also talk about how Bell and Tony actually approached this issue, which is not, he's not given a fair shake, in my opinion. Um, but they show him doing scientist things. They have him with a little swab on the uh, skull. They have some little fragments that broke off and were in the box. And he, they show him being allowed to take them back for testing. 
and they bring it back. They go to Connecticut. He works at the University of Connecticut, um, and they do. It's a uh, put to the test by his associate, Dr. Straussbach, and she runs tests. And the famous conclusion of this test is that it is a woman's skull. It is not the results that the Russians were expecting. Not only to the point that they dispute the results, and they do release a statement that no one claimed this was Hitler's skull, but they kind of take a double approach here. On the one hand, they're like, they kind of back off and like, hey, no, we were totally not as certain about this. It's whatever. But then on the other hand, someone higher up apparently tells them to change course. And now instead of saying that they weren't certain, they are ordered to claim that Dr. Bellantoni never showed up at the State Archive of the Russian Federation and the entire thing is a lie, which is great. Um, I wrote to the archive. <laughs> When we were doing research, for this, I remember. I, I remember. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, you helped me with the translation. Yeah, um, I have a response from them stating, in no uncertain terms, that Dr. Nick Bellantoni never did the research that he claimed to do. That he was never there, and he didn't do it. And it's absurd because the whole thing's on camera. Like we can literally see him do this. We can see him handle the skull. You can compare it to the pictures that the archive has released, and they are the same thing. You can look at the outside of the building. He was literally walking into that building. And they have all these different contradictory explanations to try and get rid of this and discredit him, but it really doesn't work. And, But the problem, what it all comes down to, is twofold. First... It comes down to the fact, again, that the Russian archives, they really were putting too much stock in this thing that they really shouldn't have. We go back to Dr. Ziagin. He he was giving much too much of an identification, and the archives ran with that, and it became so important to them that they cared more about being the place that had Hitler's skull than actually verifying whether it was Hitler's skull. And that's bad history. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think that what this reflects in, in, in the same way that a lot of Russian archival politics reflects the oh, it's so political. importance of the Second World War um, for political legitimacy and political legacy. Um, I mean, we are recording this now in the times of Corona, of the pandemic shutdown, and it's shortly after May 8, May 9, which famously is Russian Victory Day. and, and um, Why did we not record this on the 8th? I <laughs> do not know, but uh, but in, in Belarus, they were the only country who had a public victory parade for May 9, despite uh, Corona, the Corona pandemic, because of the official claim by the Lukashenko government that this is so central and important to their understanding of themselves as a nation that even the pandemic can not shut down their victory celebration of World War II. And I think this tells you something that is fairly telling about how this is approached. Like it's, I don't don't think it's a particular wonder that they um, did this whole thing in 2009, because when you, and, and again, in the early 2000s, because right when Putin takes over, they start displaying the skull and later the bridges. Then in 2009, when there's like tension between the West and, and, and Russia, they start, you know, showing off the skull again to Bellantoni and, and, and his colleagues in order to like present themselves as the people with Hitler's skull. And finally, I think that there is another yet, yet another investigation of the skull in 2017, which is also a telling point in time to like parade this out again and say, well, this time we really are doing the real science thing. I mean, I'm sure that we could have a whole different episode talking about the politics of Putin's Russia and make this like a centerpiece of that. Yeah, you can't, you cannot underrate the political importance that this little fragment of skull for some poor woman (laughs) seems to have gotten in the Russian political apparatus. But we also need to look at the other side though. We can talk about the over importance that the Russians have attached. But we also need to look at how this was presented in the West. Because I think that, I mean, if Russia had wanted to, they could have attacked it in a very different way. And they chose not to. Because if we look at this, again, the episode of this documentary was titled Hitler's Escape. 
and that should tell you a lot about what this episode is doing. Dr. Bellantoni is used for the science stuff, and there's a couple brief sound bites from Dr. Stephen Remy, who's an historian of the Second World War. And but if I I don't have a complete breakdown of the time frame for each one speaking, but the bulk of the narration for this episode comes from Dr. Hans Baumann, who, while he does have the doctor attached to his name, he's a mechanical engineer. He is not an historian. He's a pseudo-historian. He's the kind of guy who is brought on and his narration is just a talking point of Hitler's survival conspiracists. The show is not about science. It's not about history. It is totally about just doing what the History Channel has come to be known to do over the past decade or two. And this was, I don't, it had started moving this way before then, but this is earlier, this was pre-Hunting Hitler. This was probably when ancient aliens were just starting off if I had to check the date. This is when the History Channel is getting into sensationalism. And Dr. Hans Baumann, a mechanical engineer, is pretty much given free reign to give his theories, which are total bullshit, and based on, again, stuff that no historian takes seriously, or which can so easily be dispensed with, like these FBI documents, yet it's, it's given as history. Dr. Remy is given a few very brief sound bites, which are cut, and you can you know, you know, when you're walk, watching a documentary, you can tell when they cut really tight because they needed to just stop them from saying what they didn't want them to say. Yeah, yeah. That, that those are the kind of cuts that he gets. It's some he gets he gets to express some doubts in these brief sound bites. But when I reached out for him for comment on this, um, he was, uh, well, I should say, on the one hand, he was like, they approached a couple of historians, and I knew that they were going to make this episode no matter whether they had one or not. So I felt like I had to at least do what I could. And I totally get that. So I don't hold this against him in the slightest. He knew what he was getting into and he just tried to do his best. But um, when I reached out to him for comments, he, to quote what he told me, I would have a rather low opinion of the intelligence of anyone who considered a misidentified skull fragment to be evidence that Hitler escaped the bunker. That is a soundbite that any fair-minded producer would have included in that documentary. But they don't include it. You have to literally write the guy and make this conversation happen in order to get that from him. Likewise, Dr. Bellantoni, if you only look at what is shown on the screen, it shows him doing sciencey things. It shows him then they, they actually go to Germany and they dig on the site of where the Red Army base was in the hopes of finding human remains in the soil. And they so they show him digging for human remains. They don't find anything there. That one, that one was a wild goose chase. And then back in Connecticut, they show him and Dr. Strasbaugh in their lab coats in the lab being scientists. And then they show the results coming in and they're like, oh my God, it was a woman's skull. But that's not actually how they handled this. That's not how they were approaching this. I mean, as far as he was concerned, they were going to test to do scientific tests on this fragment. But in the first, if you reach out to Dr. Bellantoni, and talk to him about this. And again, he's a wonderful guy. I am very indebted to the assistance he had in researching this. He'll, he's going to tell you, I also maintained the mandible is the most important element in the investigation for reasons stated above. I'm not going to give you the whole email. The cranial vault is basically irrelevant due to its lack of provenance. He went in there knowing that this was just a piece of bone. Maybe it would show to be maybe Hitler's, but he didn't really think it was Hitler's from the start. He knew it lacked provenance. He knew that this was a long shot. And in the end, it kind of, it, he got the result that he expected more than anything. And that result was one that he knew didn't change anything. Absolutely. And, and I think that Bellatoni and, and, or at least how the History Channel used Bellantoni, it's, it's basically the flip side of the coin to the Russian archives, because while the Russians are, are so concerned with preserving the central legacy of the Soviet Union as they see it in the post-Soviet Russia, meaning the victory in World War II being the greatest achievement the Russian people have given Europe and the world uh, in, in the last couple of hundred years, and this, this stands as reasoning for why things are as they are today, because Putin is using that. This is the flip side of that in, in terms of like the West being not above 
literally selling Hitler and peddling bullshit to masses in order to make money. And I think that what's so telling about all of this is when it comes to the other investigation of the skull, the later investigation of the skull, um, it it falls into the same pitfalls or, or at least people f- like succumb to the same kind of temptation when it comes to sensationalizing your science and your your ideas in order to sell um books and stuff like we we um you i'm sure you also have some some things to say about those people but right when we started writing (laughs) writing the, the 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 article this podcast episode is based on um a a scientific journal article appeared uh, about the 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 once again about the skull of Hitler because the Russians had given access to yet another team of French scientists, Chalier and Brizard, who went to Moscow and who who looked at the skull fragment again, who were allowed to to do tests with it. And right when we started researching this in earnest, the book of, of Brissard came out. Like Brissard wrote a book about the whole thing together with a um, journalist, I think, whose name is Lana Parishina, who helped him also translate the whole the whole thing. And it's called La, La Mort d'Hitler. And it's translated in, in, in English as The Death of Hitler and claims to be like the final and definitive word. So the the subtitle thing. in English is The Final Word. Yeah, The Final which Word. is laughable. I mean, Absolutely. It's, yeah, this is it's a, it's a two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And I mean, I remember when it first like the article came out, which was just a science article, so it was very neat and tidy. And that's when that's kind of what kicked us off on researching this because it had some really good points. It had some iffy points, um, and we felt like it there was space to like expand on what they were discussing. And then the book we hear is coming out. And it comes out in French first. And I remember it comes out in French and we get a copy and I don't speak French and you, you have some okay French. So I send it to you and you do a translation. <laughs> and it's terrible. I remember us both laughing yes. at how purple the prose is. And I'm just like, you know what? Maybe, maybe Joe's French, no offense, Joe, but maybe Joe's French just needs a little bit of work and he just wasn't quite getting the right tone. And then it comes out in English a couple months later. I'm like, wow, it was so much worse. The It's just the most purple, turgid prose. It's, right. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's like interspersed with their personal narrative of how they discover everything. And I, I wrote out, like when I originally translated some of the passages from French to English for you, I wrote out some choice quotes and I think we found them again in, 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 oh, yeah. in the and English it, translation. It so of it. And it's, it's, it says like things like, uh, wait, I have it here. Like uh, one of the men in the archives with a sepulchral appearance straight out of a Bram, St- Bram Stoker novel. Their answer is as cold as Siberian winter. Yes, and that, that, the, the <laughs> Siberian winter one, that was the one that just sealed it. <laughs> and go and just goes Niet with many, many T's at the end. It's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, uh, it's There's so cliche. There's that quote about uh, most books should be articles, most articles should be blog posts, most blog posts should be tweets. This book this is one of those books that really gives the truth to that quote. They, they just padded out all this stuff when the information they have was really so minimal. They claimed to have all this new information, but when I read it, there was almost nothing new. Pretty much anything that's in that, you can get it from Ada Petrova. You can get it from anything that's been published in the past 20 years. They were not treading new ground. The only thing they really have going for them is that they were given permission to go into the archives and handle the skull again. This was the first time that after having been burned in 2009, the Russian the Russians were like, okay, we're going to try this again. And as bait, they also allowed them to handle the teeth. This is the first time anyone outside of the Russian chain of command has been given the teeth. They've been confirmed in 1945 by independent observers, mm-hmm. but no one has been brought back in since then. Uh, Dr. Sognas, who I mentioned before, he was able to use the uh, report that was produced with the autopsy. There was a dental report attached, and he was able to use that to compare, but he didn't have the teeth in his hand when he was doing this. This is the first time in math time, 50, 75 years, that 
and outside observers been brought in and said, here you go, these are Hitler's teeth, identify them for us. And they aren't able to do this. But, and there's such a big but here that needs to be emphasized. If we go back to 2009, when Dr. Bellantoni does his testing, they are testing the skull fragment and they are doing DNA testing. Um, they have some little fragments that they pound it up into like a paste and then they put it in a machine and the machine can extract the DNA strands and it can show them that this is woman's DNA. But there also is a caveat there I would emphasize. Um, again, getting to that presentation of how uh, hunting Hitler does things, they're like, this is a woman's skull. Oh my God, this is the most mind-blowing news ever. If you talk to uh, Dr. Straussbog, who is the head of the lab where they did the testing, she will clarify that they were able to maintain, obtain a weak female signature from their samples, but that the sample was so small and it was so charred and degraded, this was what she calls the worst nightmare of DNA testing. They didn't even have enough material to run the test twice. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. I absolutely believe that they're correct. They are pretty sure they're correct. But what they are saying is that this doesn't meet the standards of scientific testing. They were not able to replicate the results. They, the reason that they were never able to publish is because they couldn't do that. Like if they were ever going to publish their results, they would need to be able to get more material. They would need to be able to be like, we did it once, we got this result. We did it again, we got the same result. We're confident about this. Now we want other people to do this testing. And other people doing this testing, that is what needs to happen. But the Russians, they only allowed... Charlie and Brassard to come in and to do morphological assessments. And that is, that's, if there's any one thing that I find to be abhorrent about their book, pros aside, it's that they agreed to do this. Like they came in on the conditions and they accepted those conditions. And I think, I mean, if you read their, if you read what they have to say about Bellantoni, they, if I remember right, they don't actually refer to him by name. They just no, refer to no. him as like that scientist or that infamous scientist, something like they allude to him and they allude to the test and they are like, we, we know that we're following in this guy's footsteps and we need to af avoid the same pitfalls or something like that. I should, I should have written down the exact quote, but they, they know exactly what they've been brought in to do and they do it. And that is just, it is unconscionable as a historian to do something like that, in my opinion, especially to then release a book that's titled The Final Word, because they are not the final word. Like I said, this is two steps forward, then it's one step back. Yeah, and the final word, the final word has been delivered in, in, in the sense that we have confirmation that Hitler was dead from 1945. We have confirmation that Hitler was dead from the 1950s. We have confirmation that Hitler was dead from the 1960s. Like there is, it, there is no more to do about it. And the skull is the skull is a sideshow that gets trotted out when the Russians need to present something that points to their victory in World War II, or when the History Channel decides to spend like unconscionable amounts of money in terms of historical scholarship on flying people to Russia, flying things back from Russia and conducting DNA tests because the, the whole episode probably cost more money and made more money than a properly financed dissertation about Hitler's death would in, in, in the end. And I mean, what, 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 I mean, what do we end up getting out of this? So, that's that's what it comes down to. Because if you look at, I mean, if you look at what Broussard does, they go there, they're able to handle the teeth, and I think, like, if they were, if they only had handled the teeth, I think that that would be fine. A DNA test, honestly, would, I mean, it would have been icing on the cake. But they had radiologies; they were able to take those X-rays, they were able to compare them to the teeth, and they were able to make an identification that would stand up in the court of law. They were able to say these match the dental identification of Adolf Hitler. This is his dental remains. We can say that with absolute confidence. And they, they basically put an additional nail in a coffin that was already nailed shut when it comes to that. And I think that there is some minor utility in the fact that they were outsiders able to come in and do this for the first time. I'm not going to hold that against them in a vacuum. But 
getting back to my problems here, what I do hold against them is that they come in, they then do the morphological assessment of the skull. They go, they take this massive step backwards and they're like, no, Bell and Tony was wrong. This totally could be Hitler's. We're not going to say with certainty, but this totally could be <laughs> Hitler's. And that is just mind blowing that they were willing to do that. The only way that they can impeach Bell and Tony's findings is to replicate or refute his conclusions with DNA testing. And if someone does that, I am 100% certain that they will confirm that he was correct. I have no doubt whatsoever. But it doesn't matter. And that's they're muddying the waters here in a way that is just, it's, they're doing such bad history and doing such a disservice. This is, they titled their book The Final Word, but I think we both can agree they've probably given more ammunition to Hitler's survival conspiracists than Bell and Tony did in the first place. They're trying, they're, they're making it look like the Russians are trying to hide the truth because the Russians are trying to hide the truth. They're just trying to, tr and it's unimaginable why, I mean, it should be unimaginable that someone would do this, but I mean, like you said, Hitler sells and the Russians know it. Exactly. And I think this is like, this is a, a lesson from history that has not been learned and has been forgotten. Because in the Hitler Diaries affair that, that I mentioned briefly before, one of the most prominent casualties of that whole affair was Hugh Trevor Roper, yep. who Good old Hugh. did the original report. And then they, like Gruner and Ja, the publishing house that owned Stern and who was in, 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 in negotiation with, uh, among others, Rupert Murdoch, um, trotted out Hugh Trevor Roper and brought him to a bank vault in Switzerland and, and put down these books that some like second rate forger from East Germany had written and presented that to him and said, well, this is the diary of Adolf Hitler. And Hugh Trevor Roper looked at it and like the, the, the forgeries were bad in the sense that like the, the letters on the Gothic letters on top of the diaries were not AH as Kuya had believed, but were SH because he had just bought the wrong Gothic letters because his Gothic letters were, weren't like, he didn't know that much about it. So it was, it was pretty amateurish, but you Trevor Roper said, yes, this is, this is totally, this could totally be Hitler's diary in order to extract himself from the affair. And it blew up into his face immensely. And I think this is a lesson that people like Brizard and the others could learn from, from that whole disaster is that, it's not a good idea to go to people who essentially pay you to deliver the results that they want and, and who will not allow you to replicate something that would be important to replicate. So I think, I think everybody in that arrangement knew what they were getting out of it. Namely, the Russian archives were getting um, confirmation of what they wanted, namely that the skull was not female but could be Hitler's and Brizard and, and, and his friends got out of it that they had could sell a book full of purple prose with which sold actually. It, it was, it, it was a deal with the devil. Yeah. It was, they didn't, they were not, they were not there to do history. They were there to do, well, I mean, you brought up Rupert Murdoch. They were there to do second rate journalism. At right. best. Absolutely. Well, I think that, this is now as it stands. I think no new Hitler revelations concerning the skull have come out in intervening years, at least to my knowledge. I have very, very few illusions that anything is going to change about that in a long time. I think that Russian archives are going to hold on to that skull. They're going to, like, they got what they needed out of the death of Hitler, and now it's closed back up. I don't think that it's ever going to get tested unless there's a significant political change in Russia. Yeah. So, I mean, that for all intents and purposes, that chapter is basically closed. If you look at the entire picture, Broussard and Charlier's book is honestly irrelevant to this story. Like I said, the testing of the teeth that they were able to do, it's nice to be able to point to, but if you have to do it in the same breath that you, deal, that you deal with the skull, 
I'd rather just not deal with it. It was a nail in a closed coffin. You don't need it. So it's better just toss the whole thing. Absolutely. And I think, I think when we talk about like, what's the takeaway here? And I think there's a couple of things that, that, that for me at least are good points of summation of, of the whole, this whole exploration of, of, of Hitler's death and the research surrounding it. And, and first of all, I think that there is a lot of evidence, like a confluence of evidence that's almost overwhelming very early on that Hitler is dead. And for some reason that, that are for reasons that can be firmly put within a Soviet system heavily reliant on propaganda and, and, and a cult of victory and a sort of like expectation of having proof above and beyond everything because the proof above and beyond everything leads to a proof that one is actually superior. Like they, that they go back and they dig up the skull because they just, they, they say, well, we need this new thing that, that shows the bullet hole or whatever it is that leads them to, to, to go back and dig this up again. It's just, it, it just works because they, they feel like they're desperate to need such a thing in order to, to prove their historic mission as they perceive it as, as the just one. And that is effectively what creates more problems in the long run than it solves. Like, it's, it's, it's almost funny how comical the whole Skull episode has turned out, which is coming from, like, a couple of NKVD dudes just randomly digging around and digging up a skull fragment. And that ends up, like, 70 years later in a history documentary that proved that it sets out to prove the exact opposite of what they're trying to prove in 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 a in a kind of way that would never find the approval of their higher ups at the time um and i think that 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 says something about the long term consequences of improvised solutions in in such cases um but it also tells us a lot about the difficulties of of historical research into into such such things although with the death of hitler like there is hardly anything that is as well documented over the years as as that was in a certain sense and so i think i think the 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 takeaway is not is is that hitler sells and it sells in different ways because for the soviets the confusion they created is also a result of the supposed mythical aura that surrounds the person of adolf hitler and that has transformed with culture over the years but that was very present in 1945 and that is apparently very present still in 2009 and 2017. Um, I think that we have gone about as deep as one can go into this topic. So I think uh, that is time to wrap it up. Thank you everyone for listening. We will be posting a bunch of sources in the accompanying thread on Ask Historians when this episode goes live. Um, I would make one specific shout out, though, to uh, Anton Joachimsthaler, The Last Days of Hitler, which if there's any one book you're going to read on this, that's probably the best source for this. He does, he goes more in depth than pretty much anyone else out there. And as we said, Hugh Trevor Roper, he does a great job with what was available to him at the time, but he just doesn't have that forensic evidence that Joachimsthaler had available. So if you want one source... Give that one a look. And until next time, thank you for listening. This has been the Ask Historians podcast with Peyton Hunter-Jones and Johannes Breit. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history. (laughs) 